question of how did you become interested in gerontology? Okay, good question. Um, it's been a number of years ago. I was uh, undergraduate uh, at Roanoke College and working on a psychology degree and I actually took an adolescent development course and the instructor um, Dr. Jan Lynch um, was so interesting and engaging and she and I just really felt a good connection with her and she became my faculty advisor and she said I think we need to teach a course in, in adulthood and aging would any of you want to continue on and do another course in development and, and many of us said yes and so that's kind of so it actually started in an adolescent course um, but then I took an adult development and aging course with her and just a great experience. So I think she, she is a graduate of the University of Georgia and was active with their gerontology center there. Then came to Roanoke College in Virginia and um, that's how I met her in the late 80s when I was working on my undergraduate degree. So I think she's the one that kind of lit the fire and the real interest in me and it was probably something I, I thought I was interested in psychology and social sciences but I don't know until that point I had been exposed um, to the opportunities around studying adult development and aging. And that really interested me. It interested me more than childhood or you know other courses I had taken. So um, I've stayed in touch with her and, um, and then went on for, for my master's degree which was focused on experimental psychology and that's where I really became interested in memory and aging and in caregiving and how memory issues affect the caregiver who's caring for somebody with memory loss and then um, went on to get my doctorate at the University of Delaware and, and continued on with an interest in, in focusing on the family and the impact of caregiving on the entire family. Uh, so c could you then describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist? Okay. Uh, let's see, have to think through that. So certainly kind of getting my, my roots there in undergraduate and then went on for my graduate degree. And um, once I completed my master's degree, then I took a break. I didn't go straight on to get my doctorate then. And so I taught at the college level at community colleges and at several undergraduate colleges and taught in um, uh, psychology programs, but made sure they had adult development and aging courses. And if they didn't, I said, can I please, you know, make sure I have these available that I I offer them so um, so there was some fair number of uh, courses I was teaching I was also doing some research um, as I finished up my master's degree and then I guess really you know with my doctorate um, in late 90s early 2000 um, at the University of Delaware working on um, that's where I really became interested in the focus on the family as the unit and and how uh, caregiving impacts them and so there was quite a few research projects I was teaching courses for them as well while I was working on my doctorate meeting colleagues um, from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, social work in particular that I found a good connection between what I was studying in human development and how social work could be a good partner to that. So I've developed a number of colleagues that, that we continue today in doing research. So now I am and have been since um, uh, became affiliated with the College of William and Mary in um, 2000 and two or three when I finished my um, doctorate at the University of Delaware and so I was teaching statistics courses and other programs in the psychology department there. Um, they don't do much in terms of adult development and aging and haven't had much interest in that unfortunately. Um, I think predominantly it's because it's such a um, long-term uh, historical school with um, a real focus in liberal arts and gerontology is still kind of considered that, that new science and they weren't quite sure where to where to fit that in. So. Um, I certainly brought it into courses as best I could, but there aren't any courses per se that are focused kind of from a social science perspective there. Um, so I, I continue my affiliation in the public policy program um, at William & Mary, but a few years ago, six years ago now, actually I started teaching at the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. So I teach part-time there, and they have a uh, master's program in gerontology so I really feel like it's a fit you know I can teach the courses I'm not I'm not asking or inquiring why they don't have these courses available they're already there and I'm just finding out kind of which ones I might be able to most contribute to so the past four years I've co-taught um, with a colleague there at VCU and it's a research methods in gerontology course so I can and I can do that from here in Williamsburg about an hour away from where uh, VCU is located and, and all those teaching positions have actually been part-time to my primary role. I work for a health system. It's called Riverside Health System. I've been with them um, since 2006 and um, oversee their research program. So we're kind of a think tank um, within the health system, which is pretty unique. And I'm really pleased that the health system has been so forward thinking. Um, so our center is called the Riverside Center for Excellence in Aging and Lifelong Health. 
and we provide some services there like driving evaluations and geriatric assessments but I oversee the third department that we have there and that's not uh, providing services per se but really more the research and program planning and development. Um, I, I um, have brought several caregiving curriculum uh, evidence-based programs here from other parts of the country and now we you know, dispatch those here in the community and actually pretty much statewide. So um, doing some telehealth research at our center now so that we're, we have one geriatric psychiatrist in our health system um, to serve all of our um, nursing homes and, and our health system has six nursing homes spread across a good portion of the state and he just can't physically get to those when needed. Um, sometimes it's a month or more before he gets the call and can get out there to see some of the residents. So we have set up a telehealth program um, that's funded by HRSA and he can provide telepsych from his office not far from here um, to these rural nursing homes that are several hours away and be in immediate contact with either the staff or the resident there who is having some kind of you know more acute psychiatric issue as a, as a resident of these facilities. So that's been a really neat process to be uh, a part of and he talks about how excited he is and the mileage that he's saved and how much time we've saved him in his car you know just to, to be, and to be able to have more immediate access the staff really appreciate having access to him as much as the residents and the families do. So that's a telehealth project but a, a lot of our other work out of my department has been we're writing grants we're looking for opportunities for programs that we think we already have a pretty strong expertise in and that's around uh, caregiving support and around chronic disease management. So we look to you know learn more about how we can deliver those programs in the community. At what point in your career did you embrace gerontologist to describe yourself? Hmm. Okay. Um, it's I wouldn't say recently. It's probably been a while. Um, it's still a term though that I think is uh, new to folks. So they, we have to kind of explain to them and and help them understand what we're doing um, and why we care about it um, and why it really is a, a special and unique field but also very uh, interdisciplinary and in, in what we can do and who we can work with. So probably by the time I graduated with my doctorate and my doctorate um, from the University of Delaware was in human development and family studies with a specialty in adulthood and aging so that was kind of a track. I don't know that they ever said when you graduate you can call yourself a gerontologist and I know there are some folks in the field that feel very particular about you know certain terminal degrees that might lead you to be a gerontologist versus a gerontological specialist. Um, so I've kind of, that, those are colleagues of mine at, at VCU that are particularly interested around the language and you know what kind of degrees and credentials you have as to what you want to you know call yourself and, and that we need to be sensitive to that not just proclaiming everybody because they work with an older adult is a is a gerontologist so but I think with my I think by the time I finished my doctoral work around 2002 but again it wasn't that any colleague or faculty member or classmate at the University of Delaware said okay now you've gone through the adult development and aging track you're a gerontologist but I think you know I was reading I was reading the gerontologist and journals of <laughs> aging and and so I think I started to identify and be able to describe myself in that way and I'm really thankful for it I, I just it's it's definitely a calling and it isn't for everybody uh, not everybody feels comfortable working with older adults or with their families and so I think it's it's something I feel very fortunate I get to be able to do Great. Now you mentioned before the, about the professor that got you started. Correct, correct. Did you have any female mentors who impacted your move into gen gerontology? Okay, favorite? right. And who and how did they do so? Okay, so as I mentioned her name was Dr. Jan Lynch and she would have been likely my first, that would have been that first taste and kind of opportunity I hadn't even hadn't even considered that um, and that would have been in the late 1980s. Since then um, trying to think about several faculty. It had a uh, male professor, interestingly enough, which will lead me to a couple of other female uh, role models, but male professor Tom Pierce, who's at Radford University, and um, that's where I was working on my master's, and so he connected me with, uh, with several other uh, female faculty uh, in nursing there. Um, at the University of Delaware, interestingly enough, it was also another male, uh, John Cavanaugh, who is uh, fairly well known in, in his research around um, aging and memory um, and policies and um, so that was kind of an interest of mine to go and work with him um, but um, some other faculty that were there that he then introduced me to uh, Kate Conway Turner, um, Penny Diner, 
trying to think of several of my other faculty that I had there who were really focused on family studies and families across the lifespan, but um, did really have a great passion for older adults. So, and then I think it's been, I feel like I've, I continue to be mentored. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm, I, I guess I'd like to think I'm mentoring students at William & Mary and at VCU, but I think I'm continuing to be mentored too. And so there are a number of colleagues um, particularly at uh, at VCU in the Department of Gerontology that I, I feel like I'm con you know continuing to learn from. Um, what is unique about being a woman gerontologist? Great question. Um, well, we think that you know when we look at demographics that there are you know women outlive men, um, so you've got more older women. You have more older women. Um, who are then caring for spouses. We know from the Alzheimer's Association and their facts and figures reports, there are more women who are also have Alzheimer's disease, so they're more likely to be a caregiver. They're also more likely to need care. So um, perhaps there's some, being, being a female in this field, there's a greater connection to all these women who are being impacted by it directly. And I know that when I work with, um, with these caregivers, whether they're the adult daughter or the spouse, um, that I'm telling them how impressed I am with what they do. Some of these folks did not plan on being in this caregiving role and it just kind of landed in their lap and so I I tell them they kind of give me the motivation to do what I do and reinforce why our field is so important um, and, and should be and could be of more support to them. So, so I think that's part of it. Um, it's interesting, I guess I'd like to see more um, males in the field. I don't know if it's something that we've just made this seem to be more welcoming um, for women, um, but I think it would be nice to kind of have that perspective for men too. Particularly since I look at family caregiving, we know that you know it used to be that the typical theme, tip, it was a typical caregiver was a female who um, was in her mid 40s and maybe caring for a parent, um, also maybe in the sandwich generation caring for maturing children. But now we know that um, it's almost equal. It's like 60 40, and in some um, statistics shows even you know closer to that that m more men are involved in caregiving. So. Um, they don't always identify with the term um, when we explain it to them like a female would. So, um, but I think um, I, I feel a good I feel a good connection to not only my female colleagues in the field, but to the older women that I serve. So perhaps there's just that you know that nurturing and you know that kind of relationship uh, connection that helps helps me feel comfortable in what I do and hopefully doing a better job of serving them. Oh. Um, how has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? Okay. I don't know that I think about that all the time. I probably should. I have colleagues in the health system, you know, who are into palliative care and advanced care planning, and they're going, surely if you're in the field of gerontology, you should be thinking about your own advanced directives and, you know, how you want to live the rest of your life, what will your life be like after retirement, so. I think I'm so busy doing what I'm doing now, I'm not thinking about um, some of those later years, but um, I think I've learned, I, well, I guess I need to be careful that what I know um, about the aging process and about retirement and the end of life, that I need to be living it, not just teaching it to other people, but I need to be a good role model, and I don't know if I've always excelled in that area, so. Um, I think when we're saying, you know, take care of yourself and when you retire, find some activities that still feel really engaging to you so you don't become isolated or feel disconnected from your community. Um, be, a, be a good planner. Um, don't let some of these crises or accidents catch you off guard. Have family discussions about how people want to be cared for in their retirement years or at the end of life. So I think that I have that knowledge base. I hope I can just do a better job of kind of practicing it for, for myself. Um, and I think maybe the best lesson would be how important it is to prepare. I tell family caregivers that all the time. You know, sometimes these, someone's gonna fall, have a hip fracture, end up in the hospital, you're gonna get this emergency call and now you're swung into being a caregiver that you hadn't necessarily anticipated. Um, but if there are things we can anticipate that we really ought to be thinking, one day I'm probably gonna be either cared for by somebody or caring for somebody else. There's a great likelihood I'm gonna be one or both of those categories at some point. So I ought to be, I think that's my, my, my lesson that I'm, I'm trying to learn is how important it is to be prepared regardless of, of where you are in the lifespan. The Wiggle Project focuses on legacies of older women gerontologists. Within this framework, is there anything else you would like us to know? 
Well, I'm really pleased you're doing the project. I didn't know much about it until Pam uh, shared it with me, and I know you've talked to a number of individuals, so um, I'm just looking forward to, to kind of learning what you all learned from this. Um, and if there are other individuals that you all are still looking to interview that I can help connect you with, I'm happy to do that too.